Chapter 48, Diagnostic Evaluation for the GI System. We will start on 1064. The initial diagnostic tests begin with the serum laboratory studies, such as your CBC, which will include your RBCs, your hemoglobin and hematocrit, your platelets and WBCs, your metabolic panel, your PT and PTT, triglycerides, liver function tests, which include your amylase and lipase. Then you will get into more specific studies such as your carcino embryonic antigens, they call it CEA, cancer antigen CA, alpha fetal protein indicating cancer, colorectal and heptocellular carcinomas. CEA is a protein that normally is not detected in the blood of a healthy person. So when detected, it indicates that cancer is present, but you don't know what type it is till the doctor does further testing. Many other studies are available for diagnostic assessment of the GI tract. If you look on page 1066, laboratory profile for GI assessment, read over that, know the test, be familiar with the normal ranges and the significance of abnormal findings. General nursing interventions for the patient who is undergoing a GI diag diagnostic evaluation include make sure that you always tell them what is needed, why this test is needed, and the activities that go with it. It's got to be MPO or don't take this medicine. Um, provide instructions about post-procedure care and activity restrictions. Provide health information and procedural teaching to the patient and their family members. Help the patient cope with the discomfort and alleviating the anxiety of just not knowing. Informing the physician or nurse practitioner of known medical conditions or abnormal laboratory values that may be affect the procedure. Assess for adequate hydration before, during, and immediately after the procedure and provide education about maintenance of hydration. So, for instance, if they have to have contrast, you'll want to push fluid to get that contrast out of their system so it won't harden up in their GI system or damage their kidneys as we discussed in our first module. All right, stool test, a small amount of the specimen is applied to a hemocult slide. Avoid red meats, fish, turnips, horseradish, or vitamin C supplements for three days prior to and during testing. And NSAIDs should be avoided for seven days before testing because of a false positive result. Abdominal ultrasound, non-invasive test, in which high frequency sound waves you use con conducting gel is applied to the abdomen, which helps with the transmission of those sound waves. And then a transducer is moved over the abdomen so you can see the, the parts. Detection of an enlarged gallbladder or pancreas and the presence of gallstones. You can see an enlarged ovary ectopic pregnancy, appendicitis. So there's many different things, the reason this test would be used. Useful in diagnose, diagnosing acute colonic diverticulitis. Procedure of choice for gallbladder disease because it is rapid and accurate and can be used in patients with liver dysfunction and jaundice. For best results, MPO 8 to 12 hours before the test. If you have to have a barium study, you must do the ultrasound first. Hide a scan or gallbladder scan will help to determine the function of the gallbladder. 
upper gastrointestinal tract, such as an upper GI series or barium swallow. The patient is instructed to be MPO after midnight, no smoking, chewing gum before due to this will increase the GI motility. Medications can be withheld till after the test is completed, but this is a decision for the doctor, so always go by the physician's orders. Fluids should be increased to flush the barium out. A radiopaque liquid, they call it barium sulfate, is used. However, thin barium hyopaque, and at times water are used to due to the low associated risk. The GI series looks at the entire GI tract for any abnormalities of the organs or sphincters. Plus, you can see if the patient has any ulcers, varices, tumors, regional enteritis, and malabsorption syndromes. Fluoroscopy is used for the procedure. Small bowel x-rays taken while the barium is passing through that area will allow for observation of motility of the small intestines. You actually can see if there is any obstructions, if there is a ileus, diverticula can be detected too. Lower gastrointestinal tract, and they call it lower GI series or barium enema. Preparation for this procedure, you have to have a good cleansing of your bowel. A low residue diet two days before procedure, a clear liquid diet and laxative day before and MPO after midnight. Then another enema, enema morning of the exam. If active inflammatory disease, the colon or perforation or obstruction is noted, this procedure cannot be done. Visualization of the lower GI tract is obtained after rectal insulation of barium, used to detect the presence of polyps, if there's any tumors in there, or other lesions of the large intestines. Any ab anatomical abnormalities or malfunctioning of the bowel, all of that can be seen. After proper preparation and evacuation of the entire colon, each portion of the colon may be readily observed. The procedure usually takes about 15 to 30 minutes, during which time an x-ray images are obtained. After exam, make sure that you tell your client, push fluids, or instruct them after discharge because a lot of times they'll do these as outpatient to drink plenty of, wa plenty of water so that will flush that barium out because if you do not flush that barium out and it sits in your colon, it could hard like cement. Then we've got other issues we have to deal with. Other ways to visualize the colon include double contrast studies and a water-soluble contrast study, a double contrast or air contrast barium enema involves the installation of thicker barium solution followed by the installation of the air. The patient may feel some cramping or discomfort during this procedure. This test provides a contrast between the air-filled lumen and the barium-coated mucosa. Um, and this will allow easier detection of smaller lesion. If active inflammatory disease or you think they might have some fistulas or perforation of the colon is suspected, a water-soluble ionated contrast agent, they call it gastrographin, can be used. This procedure is the same as for the barium enema, but the patient must be assessed for allergies to iodine or contrast agents. The contrast agent is eliminated readily after the procedure, so there is no need for post-op procedure laxatives. 
Some diarrhea may occur in few patients until the contrast agent has been totally eliminated. Computed tomography, CT scans, these provide cross-sectional images of abdominal organs and, and their structures. Multiple x-ray images are taken from different angles and then viewed on the computer monitor. It is painless, but radiation doses are considerable. Scans can be performed with contrast or without. So it's really according to the health of your patient. But with contrast, they can see better. Must know if the patient has allergies to iodine or shellfish. Always check labs such as their serum creatinine levels because of poor kidney function. Because if they got poor kidney function, you don't want to give the contrast. Some patients may be given steroids or antihistamines if they have allergies. For renal protection, the patient is given IV sodium bicarbonate one hour before and six hours after contrast and with an oral mucomist. Inform the patient they will have a burning sensation behind the eyes, jaw, teeth, tongue and lips with this. All right, your MRI is used as a supplement to the ultrasound and CT. It is non-invasive magnetic fields and radio waves to produce an image of the area being studied. The use of oral contrast agents to enhance the image has increased the application of this technique for the diagnosis of GI disease. It is useful in evaluating abdominal soft tissues as well as the blood vessels, abscesses, fistulas, neoplasms, and they can see any bleeding that's in there. Patients should be MPO six to eight hours before procedure. Check for any metals that contain iron and it must be removed if possible. Rings, pacemakers, dental implants, IV poles, clips on gown, oxygen tanks, because the MRI machine will just snatch it. Procedure lasts around 60 to 90 minutes. Make sure you ask your patient, are they claustrophobic? May have to have an open MRI. Knocking noise will be heard. It's very loud. Contraindicated for patients with permanent pacemakers, artificial heart valves, defibrillators, implanted insulin pumps could cause the device not to work correctly. Also need to make sure the patient does not have any skin patches, such as nicoderm patches, nitro patches, scopolamine or clonidine patches on due to the risk of burns. It could burn the patient's skin. Always check with a doctor before you just remove the patch. Um, PET scan. This produces imaging of the body by detecting the radiation emanated from the radioactive substances. The radioactive substances are injected into the body by IV and eliminated in your urine or feces. Patients should be MPO for four hours before this test. No alcohol, no caffeine or tobacco for 24 hours. Push fluids and urinate frequently to remove the radioactive substances from the bladder. I didn't change my first slide, so listen to your first slide and it will go over your diagnostic test. I'm sorry. Endoscopy. This is a direct visualization of the GI tract using a flexible fiber optic endoscopy scope. 
visualization of the esophagus, the stomach, biliary system, and the bowel is possible when the, with an endoscope. Sedation is given to reduce anxiety and diminish the patient's memory of this uncomfortable event. So you won't be put to sleep, you'll get put in la-la land. Propylol has been used during endoscopy procedure instead of sedation with a combination of an opiate and benzodiazepine because of its shorter duration of action. The patient has a faster recovery and mild anti-emetic properties. There are some disadvantages including the potential to induce hypotension as it is a cardiovascular depressant and respiratory depression and the fact that there is no pharmacological antagonist. The patient should be monitored to detect any changes in their pulse, their blood pressure, ventilator status, check their respiratory rate, their O2 sats, cardiac electrical activity, and their neurological status. Upper gastrointestinal fibroscopy, or the EGD, which is a esophagogastrodunoscopy. Scoping of the upper GI tract allows visualization of your esophageal, gastric, and duodenal mucosa. EGD is especially valuable when esophageal, gastric, or duodenal abnormalities are inflammatory, inflammatory uh, of the intestine, neoplastic, or infectious process are expected. This procedure also can be used to evaluate esophageal and gastric motility and to collect secretions and tissue specimens for further analysis. You should be MPO for eight hours. Before this exam, the patient is given a local anesthetic gargle or spray. They are placed in the left lateral position. After the gag reflex has returned, lozenges, saline gargle, or oral analgesics may be offered to relieve this discomfort. So before you give anything to drink or eat, you need to make sure they have a good gag reflex. Um, a ERCP is endoscopy retrograde cholangio pancreatography. This uses the endoscope in combination with x-ray techniques to view the ductal structures of the biliary tract. ERCP is helpful in detecting and treating bile duct stones, bile duct strictures, pancreatic duct disruption, and so if any of those has issues with their structures, you could use the ERCP. It should be used carefully in patients diagnosed with acute pancreatitis because it may worsen the severity of the condition. The examination of the heptobiliary system is carried uh, via a side viewing flexible fiber octa endoscope inserted through your esophagus to the descending duodenum. Multiple position changes are required to pass the endoscope during this procedure. Although ERCP has been considered the procedure of choice in evaluating biliary disorders, it is now used less frequency at as it has been replaced by other imaging methods such as your transabdominal and endoscopic ultrasonography. Colonoscopy. This is visualization of the large intestine. It could be your anus, rectum, sigmoid, transcending and ascending colon. Uh, and this is by the same means, by flexible fiber optic colonscope. 
These scopes had the same capability as those used for the EGD, but are larger in diameter and longer. Still and video recordings can be used to document the procedure and findings. It is used commonly as a diagnostic aid and screening device. It is more frequently used for cancer screening and the surveillance in patients with previous colon cancer or polyps. Tissue biopsies can be obtained as needed and polyps can be removed and evaluated so they will cut the polyps out, send them to the lab to be analyzed. Other uses are the evaluations of patients with diarrhea of unknown cause, bleeding or anemia. Many colon cancers begin with polyps of the colon. One goal would be early detection and prevention of colorectal cancer. And if you look on page uh, 1069, uh, patient preparation, remind patients to avoid aspirin, anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs for several days before the procedure. Patients with diabetes should check with their primary health care provider about drug therapy requirements on the day of the test because they are MPO. Because a lot of times they'll be MPO, you don't want to give them insulin or diabetic oral medication because it could drop their, ins their blood sugar down because they're not eating or drinking anything. Uh, drinkable solutions can be chilled um, to improve the taste. Teach the patient to partake of clear liquid diet the day before the scheduled uh, procedure. Gatorade or other sports drinks will be recommended by your doctor to replace electrolytes that are lost during bowel preparations because you are going to have a bowel prep the day before that's going to make you just go to the bathroom, have diarrhea, just uh, and, and all your electrolytes are going to be all out, out of whack, plus you're going to be dehydrated. Instruct the patient to avoid red, orange, or purple beverages or gelatin. The patient should be MPO for several hours before the procedure based on the health care provider's instructions. Um, they will usually give you what they call go lightly. And as we said before, they will be on a clear liquid diet the day before the procedure. Um, the colonoscopy is performed while the patient is lying on the left side with the legs drawn up toward the chest. The patient's position may be changed during the test because this will help facilitate the advancement of that scope. Complications during and after procedure can include cardiac arrhythmias, respiratory depression resulting from the medication that is administered. You might have vasovagal reactions, bowel perforation could happen, bleeding from the biopsy sites, and circulatory overload or hypotension resulting from overhydration or underhydration during bowel prep. It is important to monitor the patient's cardiac and respiratory function and their O2 sats continuously by giving oxygen and the whole time that they are there during the procedure. The procedure takes about one hour and post-procedure discomfort results from installation of air to expand the colon and insertion and movement of the scope during the procedure. So get the patient up as soon as possible because they got to get rid of that air that has accumulated in their abdomen. All right, post-op post care, this is on page 1070. Your post-op care, if a polymectomy or tissue biopsy was performed, there may be a small amount of blood 
in the first stool and after the colonoscopy. So you need to inform the patient a small amount of blood is normal. But if it's a large amount and it continues, they need to notify their health care provider ASAP. Um, report excessive bleeding or severe pain to the health care provider ASAP. And if you look on page 1070 at the box at the bottom where it's got care of the patient after a colonoscopy, do not allow the patient anything by mouth until they wake up and they are alert and they can talk with you. Take vital signs frequently. Make sure they are alert. Keep patient in left lateral position because that will help promote that flatus or you can get them up once they are awake. Assess for rectal bleeding or severe pain and tell them that they're going to be have a fullness feeling uh, for a while and the more they move about the more the air is going to be uh, released. Assess for signs and symptoms of bowel preparation including severe abdominal pain and guarding. Fever may occur later in the symptoms. Um, always assess for hypovolemic shock such as dizziness, lightheadedness, low blood pressure, increased pulse. Um, and it, if it is, most of them are performed in the ambulatory care center. Always have someone else drive them home and listening to the instructions. All right, uh, anioscope, proctoscope, or sigmoidoscopy. The endoscope examination of your anus, rectum, sigmoid, and descending colon, and the, the procedure is the same as for the colonoscopy. The en endoscope for esophageal varices. Esophageal varices are, are varicositis that develop from elevated pressure in the veins that drain into the portal system. Varices are associated with cirrhosis of the liver. They are prone to rupture and often are the source of massive hemorrhage from your upper GI tract. Immediately, endoscope is in indicated to identify the cause and the site of bleeding. At least 30% of patients with suspected bleeding from your esophageal varices are actually bleeding from another source, such as a gastritis or an ulcer. Nursing support can be effective in relieving anxiety during this often stressful situation. Careful monitor can detect early signs of cardiac arrhythmias, perforation and hemorrhage. And after this exam, fluids are not given until the gag reflex returns. Lozenges and gargles may be used to relieve throat discomfort if the patient's physical condition and mental status permits. If the patient is actively bleeding, oral intake will not be permitted and the patient will be prepared for further diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. They might have to wind up going to surgery. Laparoscope, this is what they call minimal invasive surgery diagnostic laparoscopy. It is efficient, cost effective, and useful in the diagnosis of GI diseases. After creating a pneumoperitoneum gas, uh, gas using carbon dioxide is insulfocated into the peritoneum, uh, peritoneal cavity to separate the intestines from the pelvic organs, creating a work, working space for, vi for visual visualization, and the doctor can see a lot better in there. A small incision is made laterally to the umbilicals, allowing for the insertion of your fiber optic laparoscope. 
This allows direct access to the organs and structures within the abdomen, permitting visualization and identification of any growths, abnormalities, inflammation. A, a, a biopsy can be made at this time also. This procedure can be used to evaluate peritoneal disease. If you've got chronic abdominal pain, uh, they can see masses that would be in there. They can see if you've got any type of gallbladder or liver disease. The procedure has not become an important diagnostic modality in patients with acute abdominal pain because less invasive tools such as CT or MRI can be done. Laparoscopy usually requires general anesthesia and sometimes requires that the stomach and bowel be decompressed. One of the benefits is they can find the problem and remove it all at the same time. So they'll do a laparoscopic, they can go in, they can look, and, and if they see what the, the issue is, they can fix it while they're in there. Um, the patients usually complain of shoulder and abdominal pain are associated with that residual carbon dioxide effects. So you would want to get that patient up as soon as possible, get them moving, deep breathing and turn them in the bed if they can't get up to get that carbon dioxide moved. Just a picture of the physician uh, performing a EGD on this patient, going through the mouth and down into the stomach area. And this slide is showing them that's got the two for ERCP. You can see where it's got the tube and it goes down and they can see all the GI organs. And then of course, this is a slide that's going over um, the colonoscopy. All right, some other diagnostic tests. You will have your liver function test. All right, early recognition and assessment of liver dysfunction is critical to provide timely and appropriate care for the patient with acute or chronic liver disease. Function is generally measured in ter terms of the serum enzyme, such as your serum amino transferase, alkaline phosphatase, ALP, or lactic dehydrogenase and serum concentrations of protein, which are just your albumin and goblins. Your bilirubin, your ammonia, clotting factors, and lipids, because it's all got to do with your liver uh, functions. Several of these tests may be helpful for assessing patients with liver disease. However, the nature and extent of liver dysfunction cannot be determined by these tests alone because other disorders can affect these test results also. Serum aminotransferase are enzymes that reflect very degrees of injury or inflammation of the liver and are useful in detecting acute liver disease such as hepatitis. Alanine, aminotransferase, ALT, aspartate, aminotransferase, AST, and gamma glutamyl transferase, GGT, are the most frequently used tests for liver damage. So your ALT, your AST, and your GGT. ALT levels increase primarily in liver disorders and may be used to monitor the course of hepatitis, cirrhosis, or the effects of treatments that may be toxic to the liver. AST is present in tissues that have high metabolic activities. The level may be increased if there is a damage to or death of tissue of organs such as your heart, your liver, your skeletal muscles, and kidney. 
although not specific to liver disease, levels of AST may be increased in cirrhosis, hepatitis, and your liver cancer. Increased GGT levels are associated with cholecystitis, which is a gallstone, but also can be due to alcohol liver disease. Although the kidney has the highest level of the enzyme, the liver is considered the source of normal serum activity. Alkaline phosphatase, ALP, elevations may indicate injury to the biliary tree or biliary obstruction. It could be due to a tumor, uh, primary biliary cirrhosis, and primary sclerosing gangliitis. Elevations of both ALP and GGT indicate disease of the liver or biliary system. Other important tests to determine the extent of the liver dysfunctions are your serum bilirubin, serum albumin, and your prothrombin time as measured by the international normalized ratio, your INR. These tests represent the synthetic function of the liver and are used as a prognostic tool to determine the severity of liver disease. Common liver function tests are summarized on page 1066. So if you look on page 1066, so these are your laboratory profile that that I've already asked you to kind of look over those on 1066 and 1067. All right, liver biopsy. This is considered the gold standard for the diagnostic of liver disease. A small sample of the liver tissue is obtained, usually through a needle aspiration. Liver biopsy is especially useful when clinical findings and laboratory tests are not diagnostic. Bleeding and bile peritonitis after liver biopsies are the major complications. So you will need to monitor the coagulation studies. Their values are noted and abnormal results are treated before liver biopsy is performed. Other techniques for liver biopsy are preferred if ascites and coagulation abnormalities exist. A liver biopsy can be performed percutaneously with ultrasound guidance or transvenously through the right enteral jugular vein to the right hepatic vein under fluoroscopy control. So they actually can see in time, in this right moment with this procedure. Liver biopsy also can be performed laparoscopically. Are right, always listen to your lungs after a liver biopsy because the close relationship to the liver. So always assess lungs. All right, paracentesis. Paracentesis is removal of fluid or ascites from the peritoneal cavity through a puncture or small surgical incision through the abdominal wall under sterile conditions. May use ultrasound guidance when they're doing this. Also, ultrasound guidance is recommended for patients in whom percussion cannot locate the ascites or in a person, a first paracentesis is attempted, does not yield fluid. Paracentesis may be used for therapeutic reasons, such as removing of more than five liters of fluid to decrease intra-abdominal pressure that will give that patient uh, a hard time of breathing, abdominal pain, abdominal fullness. Paracentesis is appropriate for diagnostic purposes in evaluating new onset of ascites, diagnosing spontaneous 
versus secondary bacteria peritonitis or detecting the presence of cancer. It is contraindicated in cases of acute abdominal pain and generally not used in patients with lower volume of ascites, usually less than five liters. Uncorrected hypovolemia and those with platelet counts of less than 20,000. Paracentesis is used to evaluate patients whose clinical conditions have deteriorated or to measure acidic fluid for cell count. Albumin total protein levels, they're going to culture it, gram stain, or neutrophilic count. So they'll send it to the lab to see what exactly is going on. Transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt, they call this a TILPS. Um, another option for patients with ascites who are diuretic resistant or to prevent reoccurrence of hemorrhage is by placement of a transjugular intrahepatic portal systemic shunt, they call it TILPS. This shunt is surgically inserted under radiologic guidance that goes through the enteral jugular vein, creating a shunt or opening between the portal and hepatic veins in order to decrease that portal pressure. The nurse should monitor the patient for hepatic encephalopathy which is a complication of TILPS. This complication is likely caused by the inability of ammonia and other toxic substances in the gut to pass through the liver. Cholecystograph, although cholecystograph has been replaced by the ultrograph as the test of choice for gallstones, it is still used if ultrasound equipment is not available or if the ultrasound results are inclusive. If gallstones are present, they appear as shadows on the x-ray film. The patient is asked about allergies to iodine or seafood. If no allergies is identified, the patient receives oral form of contrast agent the evening before the x-rays are obtained. Cholecystograph in the obviously jaundiced patient is not useful because the liver cannot excrete the radiopaque dye into the gallbladder and in the presence of the jaundice. If you look on page, uh, let me just jump over to 1179. We'll do that in a few minutes. Um, let me see if I can find it. Let me see All right, if you'll jump over to 1179, where it's got the HIDA scan on page 1179, there's another one called HIDA scan. They call the heptobiliary aminodiactic acid. HIDA scan can be performed to visualize the gallbladder and determine patency of the biliary system. So what they'll do, if you come in and they think you're having a gallbladder attack, they will probably order a HIDA scan for you because this will show the function of your gallbladder. 